Patricia, thanks be to God for the word we received this morning. Friends, I want to talk about climbing today. I love climbing. I don't know if many of you know this about me. This might come off as shameless self-promotion. I love the sport of climbing. Rock climbing, mountain climbing, tree climbing, I've always loved them. As an adult, I've summited some of the highest peaks in this nation. I've climbed hundreds of vertical rock faces. As a child, I've loved nothing more than to scale the evergreen trees on the side of our house, sometimes to the heights higher than our two-story home. It takes a combination of physical strength and coordination, mental sharpness, and a little dose of foolishness to be a good climber. One must be willing to take measured risks in order to succeed and to face the consequences if one fails to make a certain move or take the right step. There's always a chance of falling. The trick is to reduce that chance and fall well if you must. After all, it's not falling that hurts you. It's landing that causes damage, right? I found that there is one thing that's a bit more difficult than climbing upward be it a rock face or a steep mountainside, and that is climbing downward. Not falling, falling is easy, it's down climbing that is hard. If someone's holding the other end of the rope and they can just lower you, that's easy too. But if you need to climb back down yourself, beware. I'm gonna show you some photos here just for fun. Enjoy them, um, just so you know I'm not kidding. Go ahead, Tim. This is yours truly on a cliff face in West Virginia, that's about 80 feet up right there. It looks a little steeper than it is, but it's vertical rock face, that's me. So much fun, I love that. I did fall off that climb once, took about a 20 foot fall till the rope caught me, but jumped back on and kept going. Good stuff, next slide. Here's me on a, a rock face, this is in New York State, the Shangam Ridge. Beautiful climb, I'm probably about 120 feet off the ground right here. The trick is don't look down and you won't get scared, right? See how well I'm doing with that. Next slide. This is Michelle. It's not like I'm a hero and this is something no one else can do. She gets in on the fun. Look at this, that's Chickie's Rock, just across the river. Next slide. This is my dear brother, Ethan. Ethan turned 40 years old this week. He was a good climbing partner. We still might get back to it one day. This is a beautiful shot. You can't, I mean, that is just tree, that's forest in the background. He is heading, climbing out sideways, after which he must go up. And this is also in New York State. Just a gorgeous climb. It's called uh, CCK, Cascading Crystal Kaleidoscope is the name of this climb. Just a mesmerizingly difficult rock face. He did a great job. Next slide. This is one of my favorite, well, not my favorite. This is a really neat place. This is in Ireland. My brother lived there for a time and was at a YMCA camp, and we went to visit him. He took me rock climbing. That's me at the bottom in the white shirt, and that's Ethan at the very top. He's holding the rope. So if I would fall, he's got the rope, and it'll catch me, and it's all good. But this was some wild scenery. We're out on this remote mountainside surrounded by sheep in the meadow and so forth. Just a beautiful area. Let's go one more. Okay, a little fuzzy. Person in the red jacket, blue helmet, that's Ethan. He's up there about 30 feet off the ground. That's me at the bottom. I'm holding the rope. This was a climb called Blowing in the Wind. And that's exactly what was happening. He got on this climb and the wind started blowing and the fog was coming in. And let me tell you, he got a little ways up, put a piece of gear in, clipped the rope in, Climbed a little higher, climbed a little higher. There was nothing else to clip the rope in. Ethan got scared. He didn't know whether he could keep going because if he'd fall, he was high enough above his last rope clip in that if he'd fall from that height, he would hit the ground. So he's a little scared. So Ethan's up there back and forth, all tenuous. Ooh, do I go up, do I go down, do I go up, do I go down? And finally I said, Ethan, I think you only have one choice here. That's to come down. Because if you go higher and you fall, we're in big, big trouble. If you fall, there's no one that can easily rescue us out here. We are not only below the trail that we hiked in on, we're out in the wilderness with a fog coming in quick. I said, come down. 
So he did his best to down climb from this route. Took him maybe 15 minutes to extremely delicately and hesitatingly back down 25 feet of climbing. Ultimately got to the ground. Let's just say he was talking to God out loud pretty, pretty much during those times, something I haven't heard. He used some choice language during that ordeal that he wouldn't be proud of, but he made it. Against all odds, he was able to down climb this and come back down. And once he got back down, there was a much easier way up, a couple feet to the right. So he said, oh, I've done this one before. Let me just climb right up. And five minutes later, he was done. So, but the trick is to always try something harder that you're not sure you can do. So anyway, climbing up can be easy. Climbing down can be hard. Thank you, Tim and Brittany. Today we heard the story of Zacchaeus, who we're told is a wee little man, right? According to that children's song we've heard, a man of small stature, which means two things. He was short, little guy, so unable to see through the crowd, and the crowd likely looked down on him for another reason, his profession, and therefore his place in society. Before I get too far into this passage, I want to give credit to a woman named Diana Butler Bass, who spoke about Zacchaeus at a Church of the Brethren Ministers Conference event a couple years ago. I am indebted to her for her depth of insight into the social and economic implications of this story. But before we're even told that Zacchaeus was small in this scripture reading, Luke tells us that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and he was rich which is somewhat of a redundant thing to say because anyone who achieved the status of chief tax collector was already wit rich in those days. That's the way things worked. If you had money, you could become a tax collector. It wasn't that risky a business. It was compromising, though, but it almost always paid off for those who were higher up if they could deal with the social scorn. And the key was start out with money. If you had money, you could use it to make a great deal more as a tax collector. The way it worked was the Roman Empire would hire Jewish entrepreneurs to collect taxes for them. Think taxes on goods, property, tolls, and so on. They would basically award contracts to people like Zacchaeus, to the highest bidders, to do the work of collecting taxes. The chief tax collector would then would pay the Roman government in advance what the cumulative taxes on his region was estimated to be, and then he would go and hire people to go and take the money from the people. That was the dirty work. The goal was to collect enough from all the people so as to turn a profit. They had to collect enough money to purchase the next contract, plus pay themselves and their employees. As you can imagine, the system was rife with fraud and open to abuse, officers collecting more than they were supposed to, and then being rewarded by their overseers for bringing in all this money, which, of course, floated to the top. Not all tax collectors became rich, but the chief ones certainly did. Now, with this system, this is genius, right? The Romans could stay somewhat hands-off from their subjects, and let the Jews extort taxes from their own people, thus maintaining some order and simplifying their work, which all was eventually funneled to the capital to benefit the privileged elite and the bloated military budgets, all the while boasting of peace and prosperity. Sound familiar, anybody? All the while, tax collectors bore the brunt of being hated by all the people, most of all the dedicated religious people, for they had compromised. The tax collectors had compromised themselves by their complicity with their oppressors, the pagans, the Gentiles, the emperor, from whom they believed God was going to deliver them. These were the children of Abraham. They shouldn't compromise their faith by dealing with the empire. And so tax collectors were assumed to be dishonest, for that was how they achieved their financial gain. They would tell people their tax bill was more than it actually was, and then they would keep the difference. When tax collectors came to John the Baptist, we read in Luke chapter 3, they said, Teacher, what shall we do? And John told them, Collect no more than is appointed to you. 
which would have effectively put them out of business. You see, a tax collector had to take more than what was appointed to maintain his wealth. And more than that, he had to maintain good standing among those who supported him, buying the loyalty of local civic leaders to maintain his position without reprisal. This is how tax collectors climbed the pyramid towards success and fortune. There was an ingrained system of giving and receiving favors among the people of privilege, not so much the few or the, the many who weren't well known. Prominent tax collectors would invite local leaders, civic and religious, to their homes, serving them meals and making nice with them, expecting their political loyalty in return so as to maintain their position. You see how this works? Table fellowship was a sign that you approved of a person and that they then owe you something back. An invitation was a big deal, but it was only for the worthy few, not for one's enemies. I don't really want to get into current international politics with this, but understand that the Latin term for this giving and receiving and how that works is quid pro quo. I will give you this if you give me that. That's how the system works. That's what, Zacche what Zacchaeus was all bound up in. I'll do this for you, and in return I expect your loyalty and your money to come in when it's due. That's what this was. That's what Zacchaeus was all wrapped up in. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine, leaving most common people to suffer on the margins. All the while, those who get ahead and find favor among the tax collectors can find ways to ascend the ladder, to gain money and reputation with the chief, perhaps leading to an opportunity to become a chief tax collector themselves one day, maybe even of a major city like Jericho, provided they had the stomach for plenty of dishonesty and bribery, they could make a fine living. Zacchaeus was a shining example of a journey to the top. You with me? Or should I say the bottom? Because people hated them. If we might return to our present scene, can you imagine a crowd of people waiting to see Jesus? And this short, rich man that everybody hated was eager to get a good look. Can you imagine people intentionally standing close together blocking Zacchaeus from being able to see, finally getting a chance to stick it to the man, right? Get lost, Zacchaeus. Nothing to see here. They might have thought Zacchaeus was suspicious of this Jesus fellow, this Messiah who was maybe going to lead a revolt against the Romans. That would have been bad for business for the tax collectors. Maybe Zacchaeus was a Roman agent. Nobody knew his motive. They just knew he was their enemy, a sinner, corrupt and worthy of scorn. So what did Zacchaeus do? He ran ahead, it says, something undignified for his position. And he approached a tree, a sycamore tree, the kind that produced figs, the inferior type of figs that poor people would eat. Seems about right. I imagine there was some glee among the crowd seeing this chief tax collector against every social code of the day, grabbing at this tree's low branches and scooting out over a limb above the crowd because he couldn't get through them to see otherwise. But Zacchaeus didn't really care what the people thought of him, did he? He ran up that tree, clever as can be, higher than everybody else, because of course he did. Zacchaeus was a climber. His whole life had been about climbing the corrupt ladder of personal gain at the expense of others, achieving financial gains on the backs of the poor, exploiting his position to make friends in high places. And yet this man, this crook, heard about Jesus coming to town and he went to see him. If we may read between the lines a little bit, the story reminds us that no matter how corrupt a person might seem, that person has a functioning soul, a conscience. They are not off limits from God's influence. 
nor to God's grace. Zacchaeus, we might assume, was hardly coming to Jesus to make more money. That was the last thing he needed. He had plenty of it. We begin to see as Jesus confronts him that Zacchaeus had a burden he was carrying that he needed to be free from. Call it guilt, call it shame if you must, call it what it is, sin. The weight of many years of dishonest gain, of compromising his heritage as a child of the living God, climbing his way upward through life in a corrupt economy of this for that. Jesus could have called him a sinner, judged him. The crowd would have loved that. But instead, Jesus called to him, and he said, come down. Come down and come quickly. Not a long and tedious down climb, right? But a swift one. Jesus acted to lower him. And Zacchaeus somehow happily obliged And the more amazing thing here is not just that Jesus chose to speak to this man. Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house. That's a completely backward and unexpected thing to do. Zacchaeus was the one in charge. He was supposed to invite dignitaries to his house. They didn't invite themselves. That's not how the system works. Jesus had his own way. He flipped the script He turned the tables. He went to be the guest of one who is a sinner. And the crowd grumbled to themselves about it, accusing this teacher of being around bad people. They were right. It's exactly what Jesus did. Not so much to condone Zacchaeus' work, not at all, but to recognize that he had come seeking to be saved from his burden. He came seeking to be made whole and rescued from what he had done. And in hosting Jesus at his house, Zacchaeus was not just being friendly. He showed support for what Jesus was doing. Healing, restoring those he met, giving sight to the blind, hope to the oppressed, forgiveness and new chances for the sinner. He came proclaiming the kingdom of God And he also came denouncing rich people. That's right. In the chapter right before this one, right after Jesus welcomed the children, like we talked about last week, Jesus met a rich young ruler who came asking what he might do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus told him, keep the commandments. The young ruler claimed, yes, yes, I've done that since my childhood. What else? Jesus said, Well, you lack one thing. Sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. And the rich young ruler became sad because he had much wealth. And Jesus followed it up by saying, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. Enter Zacchaeus. With God, all things are possible right? When he meets Jesus, he was not only glad to descend, he willingly and without Jesus even asking, stated his immediate intention to give half of all his possessions to the poor, and even more, to pay back four times the amount he might have defrauded people. Folks, this is not a small restitution. Let the reader understand this level of payment, of repayment, may have lowered Zacchaeus to the level of everyone else. For all practical purpose, he pledged to bankrupt himself, quit his career, remove himself from that hierarchical structure and his duty to the empire. By saying to Jesus his new commitment to life was to not defraud his people, and Jesus affirmed salvation has come to this house. No more quid pro quo behavior but instead something in Latin legal terms we might call pro bono. Giving away what one has, working without charge for the sake of a greater good. 
Zacchaeus committed to give back what he had never really deserved in the first place. And not in exchange for something else, but simply because it's the right thing to do. Giving for the good of all. It's what Jesus calls us to. When, Jesus met Zac- or when Zacchaeus met Jesus, he was set free. He didn't come to Jesus for a reward, but to make things right. And Jesus affirmed, you are a true son of Abraham, an heir to God's promise, for the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. Turning the world upside down, it's tempting, friends, to want to climb higher. For some, it seems like the sky is the limit. But Jesus sometimes calls to those in high places to come down. Give up the game of dishonest gain. And do what is good. Do what is beneficial for all people. In local news, friends, there's a casino coming to our community, likely by next year. The whole thing is a predatory enterprise that preys on people with addictive personalities and a foolish desire for improbable riches. I hope we will avoid it like the plague. I pray that its owners would come to repent and change their ways, and I hope it turns very little profit. I realize that's highly unlikely, almost impossible, given the tens of millions of dollars they're willing to pledge to the government up front for the privilege of holding a permit to operate such a facility, to profit from gambling entertainment. That's how the system works, though. They pay big money to those in charge. They then promise tax revenues and job creation. And the powers that be give them a green light to go and take people's money. It's regressive taxation in disguise, you might say. And I'm a bit embarrassed I haven't been more vocal about it over the last year. It seems all but impossible to stop its influence on our community. And with God, all things are possible. While we live in a world that thrives on quid pro quo, trading this for that, I'll do you a favor if you do me one, whether it's legal or not, mind you, Jesus calls us to a better way. His way is pro bono, grace-filled generosity, for those who have means, to share for the good of all. And for those of us with little, it's an openness to the fact that God can and may use anyone. God can change anyone. So don't write anybody off as a hopeless sinner just yet. Instead, pray for them, for their salvation. Stay awake and watch for Jesus being at work granting sight to the blind, welcome to the vulnerable, and calling down those who live by falsehood and fraud. God does not so much come to punish as to restore people to goodness, to make right what is wrong. God comes to us, pursuing us, even entering our houses in the hope that we will follow him. Our Lord's call is to come and to be at rest, to find rest, to be free from our burdens, and to walk in his light. Stop climbing, come down, recline at Christ's table instead. Come and find rest, gratitude, once and for all. The invitation is open, friends, always. Not only do we find forgiveness and new birth in the light of Christ, I dare say we enter a new economy of love. When we walk with Jesus, we'll be led to give without expecting a reward. We'll learn to serve each other for the greater good and surround ourselves with people who do the same. That's something refreshing to consider, isn't it, friends? That's living by grace. That's the way of God's coming kingdom. That's the way of heaven. It's the way of Jesus. The invitation remains, come and see. Come down and see. Amen. Let's sing together, friends. I heard the voice of Jesus say, number 493.